is a word that we need to get. Get it now. Get it in your heart now. God is saying this to all of us right now. The Christian church, the Bible-believing Christians as a whole, who is for the Lord? Judgment. America is under judgment. You know, I think it's the West as a whole. Uh, we have joined Europe in rejecting God, and now we're following the same path. I was making a point that I really want to emphasize, and then it's going to bring us back into a kind of a, a word I felt the Lord gave me for this year. And Don't get super wrapped up in this. And I know that. It's like, what? This year is going to be so crazy, so much, so tumultuous. You can't trust anything you see. You got to be careful. You're going to see so much propaganda from everywhere that, first of all, don't run with anything that you just see one thing and run with it. Do not do that. But the reason why I'm saying don't get so wrapped up in it is this. It can be easy to get distracted and we can get so taken up in this. And, and the truth is, I think um, we need to stop. First of all, the right itself has so turned me off in the last, since October 7th, I don't even know if I want to be considered a right winger anymore. And I think the lesson for us is we need to disconnect ourselves from that right wing political influence. Not to say we're not right wingers, we're right wingers for one reason, we're Bible believers. And I think I ended last week with saying, two weeks ago, saying the line, Chuck Misler's line, my favorite thing ever, it always reminds me in politics, I am not a Republican. I'm not, all right, I'm a monarchist, okay? Did everybody get the line, Did you, all right? Why, because we're loyal to the throne of David, all right? We're loyal to one throne, okay? The throne of Jesus, Yeshua the Messiah. And that does put us in the right, why? Because the original right cared about tradition and morality. And the traditions came from the Bible and morality but you notice that that's not the case anymore. That's gone. So again, throw off the, the um, you know, uh, the influence of, of politics. Not saying that we don't pay attention and we don't care. But I think that God, a lot of us ended up having come together and we were looking for anyone who could speak sanity because the communists were just taken over, which they are. And, and we were like, anybody that would stand up at all or say anything, we were like, we're all together, right? Does everybody know what I mean? Yeah. Except for, guess what? God has just blown that to smithereens. And we need to come back to stop listening to anyone who considers themselves right wing and listen to someone who's teaching the Bible, and that's it. Does everybody understand? The Bible. I am not saying not to vote, but let's not get wrapped up in it. Let's not get obsessed with it. Amen. It's going to be easy to do that. Let's not. But let's try to resist getting obsessed. But I guess my main point is stop listening to people that do not have a biblical worldview, period. Amen. All right? They don't have a biblical worldview. Turn them off. Stop listening to them. Because they're going to lead you astray. They're going to get you all focused on other things. And I have to say, the, the right now is, is becoming like totally conspiracy insanity. It's because we have had some conspiracies, not hidden, by the way, right out in the open. And now, you know, uh, everything, okay, is a conspiracy. E everything in the, did everybody notice that? And I've always been one who, who pays attention to those things. And a lot of, there's been a lot of right ones. But now, I think they're literally going insane. They're, they're losing their brain. I'm telling you, stop listening to these people. I think the Lord is bringing a judgment on, on, on that. And we need to just, pfft, no, the Bible. God is weeding all, you cannot listen to these people. You cannot. They're wrong. They do not understand the Bible and what God is doing. I'm feeling in my gut, I, I'm in my Twitter feed, you know, I've had to cut like 150 people of people I used to actually listen and cared what they had to say. And as I hope, I, as, 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 that happened to anybody else? Anybody that you followed for a while and now you're like, oh, I cannot listen to these people, they're insane. God has totally cut them off. Because they don't have a biblical world view. And now the Lord is testing us. Are you going to listen to the world, the influence of the world, or are you going to be led by the scriptures? And that's, a, that's really the main point on this that I want to make. Let's be biblical. 
when it comes to politics and the election this year, let's be biblical. This is a, a word that I feel, and this has to do with why I just went to there. Because it's this word, um, I cannot get this passage out of my head. I feel like this is something for us, but not just for us. I feel this is happening to the church as a whole. As, as, a, as the writer of Hebrews, who I believe is Paul, um, said, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. And as Peter said, judgment begins with the house of God. And that is happening right now. In every denomination across the board, I feel like this year we're going to see it way more. And of course, we've been seeing it since October 7th, all right, since we hit another phase of Bible prophecy, the next phase. I have come to cast fire upon the earth and how I wish it were already kindled. But I have a baptism to undergo and how distressed I am until it is finished. Do you think that I came to grant peace on earth? I tell you no, but rather division. In Matthew, it doesn't say division. Guess what it says? A sword. Why did, would Jesus have used that? Because he was, he was bringing them to a passage in Scripture. Moses says, whoever is for the Lord... Come here right now. The Levites come forward, and what did Moses say? Take a sword in your hand and strike down anyone who is not for the Lord. And 20,000 men fell that day. And the Levites were given the priesthood because they were faithful to their God. They will be divided, father against son and son against father, mother against daughter and daughter against mother. Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. When you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming. And so it happens. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say, it will be hot. And it happens, you hypocrites. You know how to examine the appearance of the, of the earth and the sky, but why do you not examine this present time? But this passage about understanding the sign of the time put it with, I did not come to bring peace, but division. What is he saying? Who is for the Lord? Say it with me. Who is for the Lord and who isn't? Jesus came to say, that's it. As Moses said, and he wants you to think of Moses saying, who is for the Lord? Come here right now. And only the Levites went forward. That's the picture. That's the message. That's what Jesus is saying. And he's saying to them right now, how come you can't see it, what I'm here to do? I'm not here to make, make everybody happy. I'm here to separate who is for the Lord and who isn't. I feel like this is a word that we need to get. Get it now. Get it in your heart now. God is saying this to all of us right now. The Christian church, the Bible-believing Christians as a whole, who is for the Lord? We are going to be more and more tested in this as time goes on. Compromise is going to increase in every facet, in every denomination, in every Christian group. We need to understand what's happening. We need to have eyes to see. God is separating. God is preparing his bride. You know, the gray area for Christians is being taken away, okay? And God is doing that, Okay? God is doing that. Do you know there was all different, we'll use our word, denominations and groups in fighting when Jesus came. All wrestling and, and actually physically warring with each other over who had the right interpretation. The Romans were invited in um, because uh, the Sadducees and, and Pharisees kept killing each other. And then, of course, we had five different sects just right there in, in, um, that were going on. The teachers of the law were a different sect. You know? And then we had the Essene Set. So we kind of think they were all on the same page. No, they were not. Jesus came to say, forget this nonsense. Who is for the Lord and who isn't? Who is going to focus, come back to the scriptures? Remember Jesus said, uh, the one, your accuser is Moses in whom you've put your trust. Jesus said, if you listen to Moses, you'd be with me. So I want to say it to us. Let this get in your heart. Who is for the Lord? Stop. Disconnect from things that are messing with your mind and understanding, um, separating you from a true biblical worldview. Stop 
And that's what I meant by the whole political thing. Just because it's a right winger, or just because it's someone who's, you know, does not mean that they're good. Actually, a lot of them are poison. A lot of them are poison. And you need to recognize it. Come back to the Bible. If someone out there is teaching the word and cares about the, the Bible as their foundation and what they're saying, you can listen to them. Okay? But that's it. Because a lot of us have been very influenced by the wrong people. Okay? So God is separating. God is separating. Now, the family part. A lot of you, like I said, experienced that during COVID. When Jesus said this to his listeners at the time, you know, each one of them, they had to live that passage. And I think now, remember, where our loyalty is at. To the Lord first. To the Lord first. And it's going to be tested. That brings me to this. Doctrine matters. Those staying away from doctrine and theology because that just separates and divides are now paying the price that they have, most of their people are lost. Most of their people have no idea what's going on. The church's number one job is to teach the word and to make disciples. That's the number one job. Then there's other things that we're supposed to do too. Our number one job is that. If your people cannot discern what's going on based on the word, you failed at your job. And, you know, a lot of people don't like doctrine because it's boring. What, the Trinity, I mean, I know it's three, but my brain, I just, I, it's too much doctrine. All that, you know, uh, oh, what is this camp? And what, you know, uh, I, don't, I can't remember, pre-millennial, post-millennial, what, what are you talking about? It's just too much doctrine. Guess what? It matters. It matters. We're now seeing the fruit of what happens when you don't teach the word. And I am not just talking about one group. We came out of a group. Really, our church was birthed out of a great revival that God did in the 90s. You know, it was a lot of awesome things. One thing, my dad always had a major problem. And then as I grew up, I saw it too. Was, yeah, they're great with spending time with the Lord and great on things of the Spirit. But they're Biblical understanding is a joke. And we watched, I watched personally with my own eyes growing up in the whole thing of all these people that would go to this ministry school and this school of the heart and this school of the that and then become total heretics now or crazy people who are not rooted in the Bible at all or lost as could be. I watched that movie over and over and over and over again. And now they're all lining up on the wrong side. So, uh, naturally, we left. Uh, there's a lot of reasons for that, but it came down to this. The Pope, Francis, invited them to come. The head of it to come with a bunch of these other evangelical and charismatic and Pentecostal leaders. This was in, what, 2014. They went and literally went to the Pope and, and, the, and, and sent out a thing pretty much practically saying the Reformation's over. God wants us all to come back together. Needless to say, we were done. Completely and totally and absolutely done. And really, it was the charismatic movement. Now, that was me picking on them. Do you know I could do the same thing with almost every single movement and denomination out there? Every single one of them. Assemblies of God, I think, has always been one of the best denominations. I, Hillsong was Assemblies of God. They had to get kicked out. Assemblies of God now, a lot of their leaders are total, you know, you can't trust that anymore. You have some other ones, like Calvary Chapel, a pretty good denomination. Say, they're very biblically based. Chuck Misler, you know, one of my heroes, was their number one teacher. You know, going back to Chuck Smith. They've been separated. There's a lot of great guys in that movement, but they, their head church, where Chuck Smith founded, that guy is a, is a total lefty now. Insane. I mean, I, I can't go into all the details. Just, just imagine all the stuff, and you're like, yep, exactly right. All right? And they're being split apart. So I'm just saying that to show you that it's everywhere. Yeah, everybody's seen what's been going on with the Southern Baptists. They've been in like a civil war, all right? Having all these conventions and going back and forth and kicking this guy out and this and that. And, and, and um, so that's, that's other one of the biggest evangelical denominations in the country. I'm saying, well, yeah, well, the Pope just, you know, blessed uh, gay couples two weeks ago. I don't consider them a real denomination. They're a, 
Uh, they're a, uh, sorry to say it, it's a false Christianity. They're close to the kingdom, but they're lost. You can stumble your way into the truth there if you picked up the Bible on your own and read it, but the system itself is, is, is false. All right? The Lord is giving Catholics, Roman Catholics, a wonderful opportunity right now to come out of her, my people. Come out. Anybody in there who cares about the word, about the truth, get out now. So, Lord, bring them out, Lord Jesus. Bring them out. I am simply pointing out to you that it's literally happening in every single group, every single Christian denomination and group. Now, we are not a denomination. We're non-denominational. We would technically be non-denominational charismatic. But I always put in now, and a lot of them are, you see churches doing this now, more Bible-believing, or, because we have to, because saying Christian doesn't really mean anything anymore. You know, what is your statement of faith? The Bible? What are you, what are you the Bible? That's it. Non-denominational means we're independent. We're not under some big denomination. Okay? We were, we're started by my uh, parents uh, as a family, and we were there with them. All right? In the living room. Remember the living room track? That's the independent part. Now the charismatic part. What does that mean? Okay? What does that mean? You know, it's very simple. We believe gifts of the Spirit mentioned in the New Testament did not cease, but are with us today. And the Holy Spirit, by grace, not by our own goodness or effort, likes to give us these gifts to show His glory. That's what we believe. So we believe that prophecy is for today. We believe that speaking in tongues is for today. We believe in laying on of hands and, 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 and people receiving the Spirit all through the book of Acts is for today. We believe in physical healing. As, as James said, lay your hands on them all right, and believe, and the Lord will heal. And John said, you know, John, John's great teaching on healing was, heal the sick in Jesus' name. Okay? So the point is, we believe it's for today. Cessationism, cessationism, that means ceased. Everyone say ceased. Because they believe that the gifts were for the first century church, because all through the book of Acts, all through the, the New Testament, and then they ceased, they stopped once we had the written word. They stopped. And they're not here today. I believe that's heresy. You can't make a single biblical case for it. All you can do is point out the crazy people. And man, you can do that all day long. I could do that from the, all day. I could point out the crazy people. I've been around this a long time. I, I've witnessed a lot of crazy people. And, and, and then all the, the straight-laced, you know, um, uh, evangelicals who are cessationists, they're much better off than us crazy charismatics. They are the most ignorant mass who trust in this world, hocked up on every kind of thing. From the, They don't believe in healing. They, go, they run to the doctors. They are a mess. And their younger people are leaving the church in incredible mess. And they're not able to get the next generation at all. That's what's happening to them. So, are we the crazy charismatic people who speak in tongues and prophesy and all that and flop around on the ground? Yeah, we are. Okay? Yes, we are. We are those people. Guilty as charged. All right? Now, because I've witnessed a lot of craziness, I have seen the most impactful thing for a person is going back to what did Peter say that the apostles in the book of Acts must give themselves to? The teaching of the word and prayer. We focus on teaching the word. The gifts are with us. But there's also the, the, the problem that happened. In a lot of groups, they go off into, they, they, they go in reaction mode. So then they go too far with one thing and make it all about that. The, the charismatic, now there's a lot of great charismatics, wonderful ones that aren't like that. Okay? But, um, the, and you could throw the Pentecostal movement right in there with them. They're kind of both. I mean, the Pentecostals are charismatics with suits on nowadays. It's not that much different. That would be your Assemblies of God, your, um, you know, uh, United Pentecostal. Doctrinally, when it comes to those things, we're all very much on the same page, okay? Um, but 
the problem is when you make that the emphasis, and, right? And everything is just about experience and feeling and emotion. Because, you know, people are very easily given to emotionalism and their feelings. And, and then you start to reinterpret everything in the Bible into your visions and dreams and forget the literal meaning completely. All right? So God had to bring back to the word. And I think partly also is the time we're living in. We're living, the, every single warning from Jesus to Peter to Paul is when it comes to the last days, what is the first thing they all say? Do Watch out, do not be deceived. Every time. That's the f- opening of all eschato- um, eschatology teaching by the apostles. Jesus and the apostles says, do not be deceived. Because it's supposed to be marked by an incredible time of deception. So all the more, because of the time we're in right now, we have to absolutely be focused on teaching and training in the word. And I have personally seen, I watch people get touched by the power of the Spirit in incredible ways, have miracles and things happen in their life, and five years later, they're completely worldly and secular. I've watched it, I've witnessed it, it can happen. You think someone experiences that, they're never going to be the same? Not true. Because I watched it with my own eyes. I watched people with me get, experience God in incredible ways. See the things that I saw. I'm just totally backslid. You know what I found is what makes true believers who stand the test of time, who go through adversity and and difficulty and stay faithful, are the ones that are rooted fully in the Word of God. And the only ones that do. The only ones that do. So that's why we focus on it. But I also want you to know that we believe in the full infilling of the Holy Spirit. Now our mission statement is actually on our logo. Burning for the presence of God, which means we believe in the gifts of the Spirit, the power of the Holy Spirit here with us and in us today, and the truth of his word. And we are not just one of those, we are both of those. And he gave some as apostles and some as prophets. Now, apostles are sent with a message, as Paul was. And some as prophets and some as evangelists and some as pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain the unity of the faith. Everyone say, the faith. It's not faith, it's the faith. What is the faith? The faith in Yeshua, Jesus, the Christ. Okay, that's the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God to a mature man to the measure and the stature which belongs to the fullness of Christ. What is he saying? Why did God give these things? Because what is the church's number one job? To equip and train their people. So their people can grow up to maturity and be mature Christians with a solid foundation. As a result, we are no longer to be children, tossed here and there by waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by the trickery of men, by craftiness in deceitful scheming. Deceitful scheming. And you know who he's talking about right there? Christians. Supposed Christians. This is in the first century. Yeah. Because doctrine matters. What happens if a church doesn't teach and train their people and, and be, to grow up in maturity and stand on the word of God? What happens to them? They be, they're little children who get tossed back and forth by every new thing that comes along and anyone who has a charismatic appeal and speaks well, they can twist their mind in a second. But speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ from the, whom the whole body being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Simple, foundational, you know, great mission statement. You want a mission statement for the church then? That's just right here. Ephesians chapter 4. Okay? And of course this passage. The Great Commission was his command that he gave to the apostles and to all who would become disciples, which means all of us. You know, you were given a job. Say, I was given a job, yes, but you were given a job. Every person who says yes to his covenant was given a job. 
And this is it. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to who? Jesus. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. What is their number one job? To teach them everything that he has commanded. Is it to make them happy? Is it to make them have nice well-being and a good job and a good life and a retirement plan? Is that your job? Is it just to, to be on the street and, and just feed people? That's not your main job, no? You know what your job is? What the church's job is? To teach them to obey all that I've commanded. That's the job. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age, of course. Did that cease after the end of the first century? No. Okay? So, this is the Great Commission. This is all of our jobs. I don't say this is my job. Some of you are like, I don't know if I'm up for that job. Well, it's still your job. You're a Christian. What do you mean? Your job is to become a disciple and then to think about how you can help others become a disciple. Okay? A disciple of who? Christ. What does disciple mean? Discipline. The discipline of Christ. Therefore, dear friends, since you have been forewarned, be on guard so that you may not be carried away by the error of the lawless and, and, um, error of the lawless and fall from the secure position. He's talking about doctrine and false teachers there. That's the whole context of 2 Peter. So I left that part in there. But in contrast, this is what the church, he's talking to the, the overall church here, all the believers at this point. But grow in the grace and knowledge. Everyone say grace, grace. and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be glory both now and forever. Amen.